Dead America, Idaho, Part 3 Dead America, The Second Month, Book 9 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Rebuild, Day 3 Kowalski hit the top of the desk hard, sliding off and landing with a thud on the floor. His handgun clattered across the linoleum, landing several feet away. His rifle was still over his shoulder, but his head spun from the force of the hit, ears ringing from the constant gunshots going off. He looked through the bottom of the desk, spotting the hulking beast of a man who'd just tossed him through the air like a rag doll. Kowalski looked past him as he strolled over, spotting Captain Kersey engaged in a gunfight with several others, some coming in through the door from the stairwell. The sniper knew he wouldn't be able to beat this guy with his fists, and his gun was too far away to reach before the beast grabbed him again. With only seconds before his next beating, Kowalski reached into the small bag he'd been carrying, pulling out one of the pipe bombs. He quickly lit the fuse, throwing the lighter in his shirt pocket and putting the bomb behind his back just as the large man skirted the corner of the desk, surprisingly graceful for his massive size. The beast reached down, grabbing Kowalski by the collar with both hands and pulling him completely up off of the ground. As he dangled there, the big man didn't speak simply giving him a sinister grin. The sniper responded with one of his very own, and his captor's brow furrowed in confusion. Kowalski jerked his arms forward, shoving the lit pipe bomb down the front of the man's pants. The beast immediately let him go, fumbling frantically with his pants. Now, now, now! he shrieked, and the high-pitched voice would be comical if it weren't for the life-or-death situation. Kowalski dove away, leaping over a metal desk, keeping his head down as the bomb detonated. The blast was more powerful than he'd anticipated, and combined with the age of the building, ripped a hole in the floor. The weight of the heavy desks became too much for the floor to bear, and the wooden panels creaked for a split second before giving way entirely. The furniture tumbled down to the first floor, taking Kowalski with it. Shit, 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 he cried and curled up, bracing for impact right before landing hard on the ground below. His head spun, but he had enough presence of mind to look up at the hole, about twelve feet up. In a daze, he realized another metal desk was about to fall on top of him. The sniper rolled out of the way, ignoring the intense pain zapping through him in order to not get crushed. He barely made it the desk crashing to the floor right where his legs would have been. Kowalski breathed a quick sigh of relief, amazed that he'd made it through the blast. He had rolled the dice, knowing he probably wouldn't make it. But here he was. And there's my gun, he thought, spotting his handgun just a few yards away. He crawled over, grunting, and secured it, groaning as he rolled onto his back and pointed the weapon at the hole. He waited for a moment, arms quivering, waiting for the pain to ebb before he could move. A moment later, gunshots continued above him, followed by a crash. His heart leapt into his throat, and he glanced over at the window, spotting the captain landing hard on the pavement on top of one of the gunmen. The sniper tried to call out for help, but before he could even open his mouth, a gunman popped into the hole above. A gunshot rang out, narrowly missing Kowalski who returned fire by reflex. He didn't hit his target, but the incoming fire was enough to force his opponent to duck away from the hole. The sniper held his aim until he heard the man call for backup, at which point he pulled himself off of the ground, looking around for cover. The front lobby desk had a wall behind it, but it was parallel with the stairwell door. He shook his head. There was no other choice. He ran over, ducking down and aiming his handgun at the door waiting for the inevitable. He reached down for his radio, dismayed when he realized it had been smashed. That figures, he muttered, and looked around frantically for an escape route. There were zombies at every window, attracted by the noise and the men that had been plummeting out from various windows recently. There was no way out. 
he spotted some windows near the centre of the street, where ghouls had pulled away to feed on men that had been shoved out of the fifth floor. Before he could rush over to investigate, the stairwell door opened, and he fired a couple of shots to keep the men pinned. Get up, move your ass, he urged himself, and leapt up from the desk, turning towards the windows near the front of the building that had dozens of zombies pressed up against them. He opened fire, shooting off the last nine bullets in his magazine as fast as he could. The bullets shredded through two panes of glass. It was safety glass, but the multiple impacts were enough to weaken it so that zombies could crash through. Within seconds, dozens of them poured into the building. Kowalski smacked in another magazine. Only one more after this, he thought to himself. Choose your shots. He aimed at a window near the centre that didn't have any ghouls within five yards of it. He fired several times, getting up a head of steam, or as much of one as he could muster, and leapt. Despite not being a stout human being, Kowalski managed to generate enough force to break through the window and stumble into the street. He regained his composure as quickly as he could, but the noise attracted all kinds of attention. He immediately tore away from the building and mall, deeper into the downtown core. There were about fifty zombies within the next block, all looking at him. However, they were spread out pretty well. Kowalski moved, keeping his handgun aimed at whatever the closest ghoul was, though resolved not to fire unless absolutely necessary. Halfway up the block he was forced to fire, hitting a ghoul in the head and creating a pathway for him to keep moving. As he ran, Gunshots cracked from inside the building, and he cocked a little smile to himself that his little distraction plan had worked. He worked his way up to the next intersection, looking to his left and right and seeing dozens of zombies in both directions. As he started to work his way up another block, several more came out from around the next corner. He picked up the pace, keeping his handgun at the ready as he ran. Finally, after a couple of blocks, he had a little bit of separation from the zombies. Looking around, he spotted several stores with busted-out front windows with looted stores. If they've already been looted, probably won't be hit again, he thought. He convinced himself to go inside the first store he found, a general goods store. He hopped over the threshold, which had a couple foot step up off of the curb, and into the darkened store. Not much was left, shelves ransacked and stripped bare. There were a couple of corpses on the ground, putting him on edge. He drew his knife, readying it for a stealth kill if need be. Fortunately, after a quick sweep, he found he was alone in the store. He made his way to the back storeroom, pausing for a moment before throwing open the door. Inside, he cleared the room, finding only a handful of boxes and a single chair in the corner. Once inside, he locked the storage room door and pulled out a flashlight to check the back door, which was thankfully also locked. He collapsed into the lone chair and clicked the flashlight off, letting out a deep huff of breath. He patted his torso and winced at the bruising he'd endured. Oh yeah, that's gonna feel great, he muttered dryly, shaking his head. As he sat in the dark, nursing his wounds, his mind wandered, running through all of the ways he could get out of his mess. Nothing came to mind, considering he was deep in hostile territory and his team likely thought him dead. But at least he welcomed a break from the action. Chapter 2 Captain Kersey drove the vehicle back towards Kuna, skirting around a few small packs of zombies on the road. They were still several miles out, and the numbers weren't that concerning. The mood inside the cab was quiet and tense, and Kersey assumed everyone, like him, was keeping their thoughts on Kowalski. Potentially losing him, after everything they'd been through, especially after the last month, was devastating. The captain clenched his jaw. It was even worse knowing it had come at the hands of these entitled assholes. Kowalski is a tough bastard, Baker finally said. I'm sure he's fine, Cap. Kersey didn't respond, continuing to focus on the road. Baker took a deep breath, seemingly unnerved by the silent treatment. I mean, 
Remember that time a few years back when we were chasing down our target of the week, and we followed him into that mountain border town of whatever godforsaken country that was? He babbled, the words tumbling out. Kowalski was spotting us from the roof of a two-story building across from us when an IED went off and leveled the place. We got pushed out by the local militia and thought he was a goner. Four days later, when we finally fought our way back in and accomplished the mission, we found him alive and well and hiding out in the back of a restaurant, just snacking away like he was on vacation. He let out a tight laugh. But when Kersey didn't respond, he stammered. What I'm saying, Cap, is that... I know what you're saying, the captain snapped, and I would be a lot happier if you'd stop. The private snapped his mouth shut, slumping back into his seat and resting his forehead on the window. Kersey sighed, glancing into the rear view to look at his comrade, his friend, just as upset as he was. I'm sorry, he said gently. I'm worried about Kowalski, too, but we have a lot to deal with, and focusing on him isn't going to do us any good. Baker nodded, jaw clenched, but remained silent. Kersey swerved to miss another patch of zombies, and then sped up again. Several minutes later, they were at the entrance to Kuna. As they waited for the gate to open, a few shots cracked, and he glanced in the rearview mirror. A few zombies about a hundred yards back dropped to the ground. His shoulders relaxed a little that it was corpses, and not the Chosen chasing them. As they pulled inside, the gate closed behind them, and Kersey parked. Before he could turn off the engine, the people they'd rescued piled out, Civilians rushing up to greet the friends they hadn't been sure were alive. Kersey watched the display, heading around to the hood of the vehicle to stand with his soldiers and Zeke. I need to report in to Ivan, Zeke said. Kersey nodded. I'll come with you, he said. The rest of you, get something to eat and resupply if you need to. We're not staying too long. Moss nodded. Shall we get the others? he asked. Put them on standby, Kersey replied. Meet over by the northern depot. Yes, sir, Moss said, and turned, heading off with the rest of the pack. Kersey followed Zeke through the town towards Yvonne's office, but the latter fell into step with the captain, clasping his hands in front of him nervously. I know you don't want to talk about it, he said softly, but I just want you to know that I'm real sorry about Kowalski. It breaks my heart to know he d— Kersey shot him a death glare that stopped his voice in his throat and Zeke coughed to cover up what he'd been about to say. Ahem, it breaks my heart to know he's in a difficult situation, because our people got trapped, he corrected. Kersey took a deep breath. It's not your people's fault, he insisted. This is squarely on the Chosen. They killed one of my men right in front of me before we even knew you guys existed. We all knew the risks coming here. Still, Zeke said slowly, the people of this town are thankful for what you've done for us. The captain gave a single sharp nod. Well, with the way things are going, I sincerely doubt it will be the last thing we do, he said. The duo walked into Yvonne's office, finding her leaned over a map with a few other people. She spotted them and stood up straight, waving at the men around her. Thank you for your help, gentlemen, she said with a dismissive air. I'll let you know if I need anything else. The three men nodded and headed out past Kersey and Zeke, while Yvonne waved them over to the map. Glad to see you've returned safely, Captain, she said. Kersey shook his head. I wish I could say the same about our people, he replied. One of yours didn't make it. And your people? she asked. One is still missing, he said, clenching his teeth. She nodded, her eyes showing gentle sympathy. We're in contact with a few people who are still in the city, she said. People who didn't want to move, or who couldn't. I'll have them keep their eyes out for him. Thank you, Kersey replied, but shook his head. But I'm concerned that if the Chosen know he's out there, they might go after him. Yvonne grinned. Don't you worry, Captain. You can probably tell by looking at me that I wasn't born yesterday, she drawled. My people are very careful, especially on an open frequency. We've had runners out to them over the last few weeks, delivering supplies and whatnot. They also delivered a few safeguards for radio chats. 
He nodded slowly. Encoded messages, he replied. I'm impressed. Oh, honey, you just wait until tomorrow when Zeke here starts taking you around to the munitions plants, she replied with a wink. She motioned then, drawing their attention to the map, which had half a dozen circles on it around the southeast side of town, which was where they were. Every circle on here is a plant, she said, and we're going to take you out there first thing in the morning to start securing them. Your people will clear it, and then some of my people will go in and keep it that way. Kersey took a deep breath. If it's all the same to you, I'd like to get started this evening, he said. She shook her head immediately. Captain, I have no doubt your people are capable, she assured him. But when that sun goes down, the danger factor goes up exponentially. He held up his hands, palms out. I understand that, but— But you're going to humor me, because you are a gentleman who wants to show his gratitude for everything I'm doing, and will continue to do for you, she cut in, cocking a brow. Kersey chuckled despite himself, and then finally nodded. You're right, he admitted. We have had enough excitement for one day. Thank you, Captain, Yvonne said, offering him a grin. Dinner is going to be in an hour in the main hall, center of town. He nodded again. Thank you, he replied. I'll let my people know. Zeke, would you stay behind? Yvonne asked. I'm going to need you to get a few things together for tomorrow. Of course, he said, and then turned to Kersey, extending his hand. I look forward to working with you tomorrow. The captain shook. Likewise, he said, and then headed outside walking towards the rendezvous point. Despite being wired for sound and wanting to keep busy, he was glad that Yvonne was forcing some rest on them. His men deserved it. When he reached the area, his remaining seven men stood outside, all geared up, checking their weapons. "'What do you say, Captain?' Corporal Bretz asked. Kersey shook his head. "'You boys stand down. We're done for the day,' he announced. The soldiers glanced at each other, confused. Yvonne insisted, the captain explained. Apparently things get sketchy out there once the sun goes down. Sketchy? Baker asked dryly. If we didn't go out after dark because the place was sketchy, none of us would have a drinking problem. Brett smirked. Well, we would, he drawled. But we just have gotten in fewer bar brawls over the years. Baker held up a hand, but then nodded. Good point, he conceded. Yvonne has a map for us and has identified six locations for us to check out and hopefully secure, Kersey explained. Once we do that, her people will move in to fortify until the Seattle team gets here. Moss crossed his arms. With only eight of us, that's going to be a chore, he said. We're going to hit the sites one at a time so we can go in with as much firepower as possible, Kersey replied. We shouldn't have issues clearing out a place with eight of us. Sergeant Copeland raised his hand. Captain, I have a suggestion, he piped up. Let's hear it, Kersey said with a nod. Copeland took a deep breath. Well, I've been thinking. We kind of got ourselves into a full-scale war here, he said. I know resistance was a possibility, but I don't think that any of us anticipated this level of coordinated response against us. That's an understatement, Baker added dryly. I know we're already short-handed, Copeland said slowly but I think we may need to be even more short-handed. What? Baker blurted, turning to the sergeant with wide eyes. Are you crazy? Kersey raised a hand to settle the private. Let's hear the rationale, he said calmly. Sooner or later, we may have to hit them where they sleep, Copeland continued, after nodding to the captain in thanks. And from what the locals have told me about their camp, it might be in our best interest to have a couple of us that they haven't seen before. I've heard that they'll take in civilians if they bring them something useful. Like a soldier who has been causing them problems? Kersey quipped. Copeland nodded. That's my thought, he replied. Okay, who haven't they seen? Kersey asked, looking around. The sergeant shrugged. Best I can figure it's Kowalski, who is MIA at the moment, Johnson muttered. Wade and myself, Copeland finished. Moss let out a long belly laugh, putting a hand to his forehead, and the others stared at him in blinking confusion. "'Something funny, Private?' Copeland asked, his tone terse. 
Oh, very funny, Moss replied, wiping fake tears from his eyes. You know damn well they saw you. Copeland's brow furrowed, and he shook his head. I was never close enough for them to get a good look at me, he insisted. At least nobody who was still alive. Oh, come on, man, Moss drawled, still laughing. We're in Idaho, in the apocalypse. Do you know what the black population of the state is right now? It's me, you, and Ivan. You show up on their doorstep trying to turn someone in, and they'll gun everybody down. The sergeant wrinkled his nose, looking around at all of the other soldiers nodding in agreement. He sighed and gave a defeated shrug, turning to Wade. The private looked around helplessly. You all know I'm a sniper, right? He asked. Like, I specifically picked this because I don't want to get close to people? I promise that if you do this, Kersey declared, you'll be able to shoot as many people as you want. Wade pursed his lips and then pointed at his captain. And next time we find a cache of weapons, I get first pick, he added. Even if Kowalski makes it back in one piece and there's only one fifty cal rifle, I get first pick. Kersey chuckled, shaking his head. I could just order you to do this, he said. But sure, you get first pick. Okay, I'm in, the private said, snapping his fingers and bouncing on the balls of his feet. What do you need me to do in the meantime? I'll turn you over to Ivan, Kersey replied. Maybe you can help them out with their defenses. Get them beefed up in case we poke the bear a little too hard. Wade nodded firmly. I can do that, he promised. Kersey checked his watch and then looked around at his team. All right, gentlemen, he said. Dinner is in exactly fifty-three minutes. Until then, try to make yourselves useful. Chapter 3 Several hours had passed since Kowalski had barricaded himself inside the small storage room. He snoozed as comfortably as he could in his chair before a noise inside the store woke up violently. His breaths coming hard and violent, the sniper startled, looking around in an attempt to get his bearings and remember where he was. It was dark in the room, and there was no sunlight peeking through the bottom of the door, which meant that night had fallen. Kowalski readied his handgun and carefully walked over to the interior door to listen. He put his ear up against it, finding sluggish footsteps and some moaning. Relief washed over him that it was only one set, and they grew quieter as he silently stood there. That was close, he thought to himself. You gotta get moving. This is not a long-term solution. Kowalski carefully opened the interior door, peering into the main store. Luckily, the moon was out, giving him a little bit of light bathing the area. There was one zombie by the broken window of the store, but just past it on the road, dozens of figures shambled around in the darkness. He let out a defeated sigh and closed the door quietly, securing it once again. Well, that is most definitely not the way out, he thought. Wait, wait, shit, man. Do you even know where you're going? Think! He took a deep breath and began to pace around the small room in the dark, contemplating his next move. Think about where you were, he muttered under his breath. Uh, east side of town, I think. He rubbed his chin as he moved. So if I go east, I should be able to get out into the middle of nowhere. Not sure how that helps me yet, but I might be alone, which is more than I have now. He stopped pacing and straightened his shoulders. Okay. I'm going east. He walked to the back door and paused for a moment, rubbing his forehead. Shit. Which way is east? He thought, and then retraced his steps to where he'd been, pantomiming running through the streets. After crunching his internal compass for a while, he was satisfied, choosing to go right once he got out the back door. Okay, I got it, he murmured, and then swallowed hard. Okay, I think I got it he thought, doubting himself internally. If not, this is going to be a short trip. Kowalski slung his rifle over his shoulder, checked his handgun, and then readied his knife in his offhand. He unlocked and twisted the knob ever so slightly, and eased open the back door. Immediately a creature grabbed the door and forced it open, 
forcing its body inside and getting right into the sniper's personal space. He threw up his arm as he staggered back, shoving it against the ghoul's chest. Kowalski quickly jammed his knife upwards towards the zombie's head, in shadow due to the lack of light, and missed. After a couple of nearly blind jabs, the creature went limp and fell to the floor. The sniper stood there for a moment, breathing hard and tense, waiting on something else to come in. After several seconds of heavy breathing, but nothing else, he moved back towards the door. He peeked out, looking down the alley to the left, seeing figures moving about ten yards away. But to the right, it was a clear path to the street, so he didn't waste time, and slipped out into the alley, moving quickly towards the edge of the building. Kowalski scanned the area, seeing a couple dozen zombies spread out to the left and right, with a few more in the alleyway across the street. He looked past them, seeing at least four or five more blocks of buildings. I had better be going in the right direction, he thought bitterly, and broke from cover moving slowly but deliberate. There weren't any zombies within ten yards of him, and by staying quiet he hoped he could manage to not draw attention to himself. Much to his surprise, the lack of light and sound provided him just enough cover to get most of the way across the street before a zombie noticed him. Immediately after that, however, its moans filled the air, which was quickly followed by dozens of others. Well, that was fun while it lasted, he muttered, and darted into the next alley, where a trio of zombies were lined up a few yards apart. The sniper opted to remain silent, using his knife to great effect, jamming it into ghoul heads as he moved as quickly as he could. He barely paused, simply jabbing, tossing the body, and moving past. Kowalski approached the end of the block glancing over his shoulder as the moaning from the mob forming behind him continued to intensify. It was a good twenty yards back at least, so he had a bit of wiggle room, but before he could reach the end of the building more ghouls came around the corner. There were about a dozen of them coming his way, with two directly at the edge of the building. He lunged forward, stabbing one in the eye socket while delivering a forceful front kick to the one directly behind it. Kowalski didn't have time to think or plan his next move. All he could do was continue running. He darted out of the alley to avoid becoming trapped, moving into the middle of the road. He glanced down the next alley, which was jam-packed with creatures, so there was no way for him to go that way. He frantically looked around, seeing shadowy mobs of creatures moving in every direction. Finally, he decided to run north lowering his shoulder and plowing through a couple of zombies before changing tactics to weave in between them. He got up to the next intersection, looking back to the east and seeing it was about the same density of ghouls as he had just run through. He started in that direction, getting halfway up the block, continuing to fight off what came in his direction. When he could, he stabbed into skulls, but most he knocked them over to get past. As he ran, something caught his attention. The building to the north had a light coming from a second-floor window. The curtains were closed, but he could clearly tell something was lit up inside by the glow around the edges. Kowalski paused for a brief moment in the road, trying to locate the entrance of the building. He spotted it, a full glass entrance with a door in the middle of two large windows. Kowalski didn't hesitate, rushing over towards it and dispatching a couple of zombies in the process. He reached the door, pushing and pulling, but to no avail. It was locked up tight. Despite the low light, he could see a chain on the other side of the glass. Shit, he muttered. I gotta get in there. He looked back over his shoulder. A couple dozen zombies were within ten yards of him, closing in from all sides. He contemplated using his gun, but then decided against it, because it would draw every zombie in a ten-block radius to the building preventing any hope of an escape later. He ran towards the crowd, giving the first zombie he spotted a swift kick to the chest and sending it back into the others. There was one other creature nearby that lunged towards him. At one time, the zombie had been a young man and fairly well built, so Kowalski ducked out of the way, allowing the ghoul to pass him by. Then he swung around and grabbed it by the back of the shirt collar and belt, using the momentum to run towards the front door. 
The creature was clumsy, but he was able to hold it up long enough to use its head as a battering ram for the bottom half of the glass door. The skull smashed into the glass, the force enough to crack it and partially break it free of its frame. The zombie thrashed about, moaning, clearly not happy about its predicament, but Kowalski was undeterred, pulling the corpse back and throwing it forward with everything he had. The zombie crashed completely through the bottom panel of the door and into the lobby. Kowalski quickly ducked inside, jamming his blade into the back of the confused ghoul's head, leaving the corpse limp as he swept the area. There was a couch nearby, and he rushed over, dragging it over to the door. He flipped it onto its back and shoved it against the opening, then grabbed the heavy corpse and shuffled it over, heaving it up onto the couch to help weigh it down. The zombies outside didn't seem to notice or care that the bottom panel was out, continuing to bang on the top half of the doors and the windows. Kowalski turned his back on them, doing a more thorough sweep of the lobby. When he found a recliner in the corner, he dragged it over and shoved it against the zombie on the couch, figuring a little more weight couldn't hurt. He gave the zombies outside one last glance, and then headed for the set of stairs near the middle. He raised his handgun and approached them slowly. He'd been through enough during the apocalypse to know that there might be humans that weren't happy to see him. He worked his way through the lobby, the moonlight from the front windows diminished by the throng of ghouls, but he managed to see nobody was on the first floor. When he reached the second floor, there was a ton of furniture all over the hallway. Couches, mattresses, dresses, anything that could be used to slow down a zombie was there. It stretched from the stairs all the way back to the front of the building, where he'd seen the light from outside. Kowalski carefully climbed over the various household debris, making it to the door. He listened for a moment and heard some panicked whispering coming from inside, followed by some shushing. He took a deep breath and gave a light knock on the door, brightening his tone in hopes of putting the inhabitants at ease. "'Excuse me, but do you have a moment to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ?' he asked. His hopes were dashed at the sound of a shotgun racking inside. "'Thank you, but we are happy with our current Lord and Savior.' Sawed off shotgun, someone drawled. Kowalski chuckled. Understandable, he agreed. Mister, I don't know who you are, but if you are looking for trouble, you'll find it here, the man declared. Not looking for any trouble, Kowalski promised. Just a place to recoup for a few hours, and then I'll be on my way. There was some soft chatter inside, and no matter how hard he strained his ears, he couldn't make out what they were saying. Okay. We can give that to you, the man finally called. But you holster any weapons you have, or else I'll send you to your maker. Yes, sir, Kowalski replied, and holstered his handgun. He didn't have a lot of options, so he had to play nice. He raised his hands, and the door opened slowly. A blonde woman quickly moved out of the way to reveal a stout man with a shotgun. He looked to be in his early fifties, like an aged linebacker that had let himself go a bit. Okay, come on in, he said, slowly. Kowalski moved slowly past the blonde woman, who looked slightly younger than the man, but not by much. She secured the door behind him, and he got a good look at the apartment. It was a mess, like they hadn't cleaned up in weeks. There were provisions stacked up everywhere, as if they'd raided every apartment in the building, which they probably had. Camping gear lined the walls, stacked on top of supplies, including a couple of lanterns that glowed brightly. Quite the collection of stuff here, Kowalski said. The man grunted. Wasn't easy to get, he said. Our neighbors either fled, or were the reason the others fled. There were five of us left in the building, the woman added, curling her arms around herself. By the time we cleared it out, it was just Dennis and me. Kowalski nodded. A lot of that going around, he said gently. Believe me, I know. Traveled further than most during this. The man, apparently Dennis, motioned towards the couch, finally lowering his gun, though keeping it at the ready in his hand. Kowalski collapsed down onto the couch, happy to be sitting on something soft, and the older couple sat on the love seat across from him. So, Dennis drawled, why don't you start by telling us who you are? 
and what you're doing in a zombie-infested town at this hour. Well, my name is Private Kowalski, the soldier replied. My team and I were helping out some other survivors in Kuna to get some of their people out. Didn't quite go the way we planned, and I got left behind. The man tongued his cheek. So, you're a military boy, huh? he asked. Yes, sir, Kowalski replied. Not exactly a popular occupation in these parts, Dennis said dryly. Yeah, I've been getting that a lot this month, the soldier replied with a sigh. Kind of frustrating, too, if I'm being honest. People are acting like I'm the one who made the decision to retreat to Kansas, and not someone about seven miles above my pay grade. Dennis nodded thoughtfully. That's understandable, he said, and put the gun down, setting it on the floor beside him. So you got separated from your friends? The woman asked, folding her hands in her lap. Yes, ma'am, Kowalski replied. Honestly, they're probably going to be surprised I'm still alive. Didn't exactly get separated under the best of circumstances. What happened? She asked. Lots of gunfire, an explosion or two. Kowalski quipped with a smirk and a shrug. Just another day in my life. Dennis laughed and patted the woman on her leg. Karen, why don't you fix our new friend here some tea so we can rest properly? He suggested. She hesitated for a moment, but he gave her a nod, and she got to her feet, heading for the kitchen. Afraid I don't have any cream, she called, as she picked up the kettle. But I have some sugar, if you like. Plain will be fine, ma'am, Kowalski replied. Thank you. She nodded and fired up a camping stove to boil water. Sounds like you've been through the ringer, Dennis said. And I don't just mean today. Kowalski took a deep breath. That is an understatement, he said. I don't know if you've heard, but the military took over Seattle. Dennis blinked. Really? He shook his head in disbelief. They, they took it completely over? Kowalski nodded. Yes, sir, he replied. Took just about everything we could muster, but we cleared it out. Now we're setting up a safe zone for everyone. I always wanted to go to Seattle, Dennis said wistfully. See the Space Needle. I guess I still might be able to. He paused and swallowed hard. Assuming it's still standing. The soldier nodded emphatically. Oh, yeah, it is, he said. We didn't do a whole lot of bombing runs, so most of the city is still standing. Well, we should go ahead and pencil that in for our yearly trip next year, Dennis replied. Figure our setup should last until then. Kowalski leaned forward a bit. You know... There are survivor communities out there, he said. The one in Kuna seems like it's pretty solid. If you do want to come with me, I'm sure I can get us there. Dennis shook his head. Appreciate the offer, but heard too many horror stories about them being attacked by the Chosen, he replied. The soldier cocked a brow. Ah, so you're aware of the Chosen? he asked. Oh, yeah, the man replied, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. Set up in their little kingdom, ruling over everyone within their domain. We'd just as soon stay out of it. Based on the encounters with them so far, that's probably a good strategy, Kowalski replied. Karen entered with a cup of hot tea, handing it over to the soldier. Thank you, ma'am, he said. You drink up now. We have plenty, she said with a smile. He took a big sip as she turned to retrieve the other two cups for her and Dennis. He savored the hot brew, but started gulping it down too quickly. I'm sorry. I'm being rude, he said, stopping when his cup was half empty. It's just, I've been locked up for the last few hours without anything. Karen returned and offered a smile. Oh, you're fine, she insisted. Drink up. She handed Dennis his cup, and the two of them joined in the sipping. Kowalski downed the rest of it, but felt a little bit of grit on his lips. He looked down into the bottom of the cup suspiciously. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I put sugar in yours? Karen piped up, her voice a little shrill. Apparently so, Kowalski murmured. Well, I promise I won't do that on the next cup, she said quickly. The soldier's mind began to race. Something felt wrong. Very wrong all of a sudden. You know, I'm being rude by barging in here, he said. Why don't I just take up residence in one of your neighbor's places? He tried to get up, but his legs gave out. 
and he dropped to one knee. Dennis leaned forward, pushing him gently back onto the couch. It's okay, fella. Just let it wash over you, he cooed. What did you do to me? Kowalski asked, and his tongue felt thick. He tried to reach for his handgun, but Dennis pulled it out of the holster and tossed it to the table behind him. For what it's worth, it isn't personal, he said, pressing his palms together. The soldier's head lolled, darkness closing in on the edges of his vision. You son of a bitch. He trailed off, words soupy. As much as I'd love to see the Space Needle, I'm much more interested in seeing inside the chosen compound in Nampa, Dennis said. They put out a broadcast a few hours ago, saying whoever brought them a soldier will be granted entry. You're our golden ticket, my friend. He tried to utter an insult, but he couldn't make his mouth cooperate. Jesus, woman, Dennis said with a laugh but his voice sounded far away. How much of that stuff did you use? He went down like a sack of bricks. Five times the normal dosage, Karen's voice floated through his brain. Yeah, that'll do it all right, Dennis barked. Go on, get on the radio to Nampa. Tell them we have a soldier, but they have to send transport. Kowalski didn't hear a reply, as nothingness swallowed him whole. Chapter 4 Rebuild Day 4 The sun was barely up over the horizon as the group headed off towards the first munitions plant. Kersey was in the lead vehicle as three trucks tore down the road, headed south from Kuna. Everybody but Wade was with the troops, plus Zeke. How far away is this place? Kersey asked. Zeke looked at his map. About three more miles, he replied. This is one of the older plants. Been here since the 80s. Not like most bullets have changed all that much since then, the captain mused. If the machines were working back then, probably still doing just fine today. One can only hope, Zeke agreed. This one is the furthest away from Nampa, and there's no real easy way to get to it from there without going through Kuna. So with any luck, there won't be any resistance. Kersey tilted his head back and forth. Armed resistance, at any rate he said dryly. Yeah, that's true, Zeke said, and took a deep breath. More than a month into this new world, and I still haven't quite wrapped my head around the dead walking around. Not sure that's something you can ever get your head around, Kersey said dryly. Zeke hesitated, and then looked over at the captain. So, can I ask you something? he asked. Sure, Kersey replied with a shrug. We have a few minutes. Do you know what caused all this? Zeke asked, waving a hand in the air to gesture vaguely around him. I heard that you were pretty high up on the military food chain, and I was just wondering if you'd heard anything. Or is that classified? Kersey laughed. Not sure much of anything is classified these days, he admitted. Even if our enemy did hear what we were planning, they don't have the intelligence to do anything with it. I guess that's true, Zeke said with a chuckle. But to answer your question, Kersey said and paused for a beat. I don't have all the details, because once I was brought into the loop, the why didn't really matter anymore. But from what I've heard, there was a bioterrorism event in Austin. Some asshole released the virus at a football game. By the time anybody knew what was going on, it was already too late, and it had spread around the country. He sighed. Hell, spread around the world. Zeke gaped at him. One man brought down the world? He blurted. Just one? Just ended it? Kersey nodded. It would appear that way, he confirmed. A man with that level of talent could have cured cancer, but instead, he did this. Zeke wrinkled his nose and then cocked his head. If you think about it, he said slowly, he was successful in bringing down the number of cancer patients. The two men shared a dark horror laugh, shaking their heads together. Yeah, I guess that is one way of looking at it. Kersey said dryly. Zeke let out a deep breath. Sorry, laughter is my defense mechanism against horrifically bad news, he said. Yeah, no worries. I've been there, the captain assured him. Had a friend who worked in the combat support hospital, and their humor was darker than a black hole. Zeke raised an eyebrow. 
combat support hospital? he asked. Is that like a MASH unit? Kersey nodded. Essentially the same thing. It's what the MASH unit evolved into, he said. So they saw horrific things on an almost daily basis. You ever see videos online of an IED going off on a convoy? Zeke shuddered and then swallowed hard. Yeah, he said. Well, my friend was one of the people who helped the victims who were in those vehicles, Kersey explained. So you can only imagine what they saw. Zeke shook his head. Yikes, he quipped. I'll stick to zombies. Speaking of, Kersey trailed off, stopping the truck convoy about half a mile from the munitions plant that was in the middle of a field, away from any other buildings. There was a tall fence around the complex, which had multiple buildings. At that distance, they could see figures moving inside the fence line. Got binoculars? Kersey asked, holding out a hand. Zeke reached into the glove box and pulled out a set, plopping them unceremoniously into the captain's waiting palm. Kersey got out of the truck and looked through them, a defeated sigh escaping his lungs at the sight. That good, huh? Zeke asked as he walked around to join him. Kersey shook his head and handed the binoculars over. The other man took them and looked through the glass, letting out a defeated sigh of his own. The interior of the complex was full of hundreds of zombies. The parking lot was nearly full of cars, and he shook his head as he lowered the binoculars. Looks like this thing hit during a shift and they locked things up tight, he muttered. Kersey nodded slowly. One person who doesn't want to take a sick day comes in. And we have a zombie zoo, Zeke finished. The other soldiers got out of the trailing vehicles and approached, regarding Kersey's unamused expression. Oh, hell. I know that look, Johnson drawled, shaking his head. We're in for a shit show morning, aren't we, Cap? Bretz pulled out his own pair of binoculars and looked through them, letting out the same sigh as the others had. Oh, very much so, he murmured. Cap, I don't know if we have the firepower to clear this out. Good thing we don't need to, Kersey said. Bretz lowered the binoculars and shot his captain a confused look. Cap? We just need to scope it out and see if it's viable, Kersey explained. If it is, we can borrow a few of Zeke's friends from town and clear it out at our leisure. If it's not, we don't have to waste our time. Bretz nodded thoughtfully. Okay, he said. So I'm guessing you have a plan? Team of two get inside the perimeter, gets to the fire escape on the building on the right that leads to the second floor. Kersey began motioning as he spoke, and the soldiers gathered around. Quick visual check to make sure the machines look operational. With that many of those things in there, it's safe to assume the plant was fully stocked, so it's also safe to assume we're good to go as long as the machines weren't damaged. Bretz took a deep breath. Baker, you game? he asked smacking his comrade on the shoulder. "'The fuck I'd do to you, Corporal?' Baker demanded. "'Why you gotta drag me into this?' Bretz cocked a brow. "'I just spent twenty minutes in the truck listening to you whine about the cold up here,' he drawled. "'Figured if you got your blood pumping, it'll warm you up.' Baker huffed. "'I can accomplish the same thing by sitting in the truck cab with the heat on full blast,' he shot back. Well, maybe next time you'll offer that solution before I volunteer you for a suicide run, Brett said brightly, and started to walk the perimeter. Baker let out a defeated groan and began to follow him, but Zeke raised his palm. What about the cars? he piped up. Baker paused. Yeah, maybe I can warm up in one of those, he joked. Zeke shook his head. No, I mean, why not use them as a distraction, he suggested. They're on the opposite side of the compound. It's only been a month. Battery should still hold a charge, Moss mused. I'm willing to bet more than one of those big-ass trucks has an alarm on them. Kersey nodded thoughtfully. Copeland, Moss, you think you can handle that? he asked. The sergeant nodded sharply. Yes, sir, he said, and then turned to Bratz. Give me five minutes and you'll have a clear path to the building. The corporal grinned and then waved to Baker. Let's get in position. Baker sighed, and they headed off to their position. Copeland led Moss across to the opposite side of the compound, staying far enough away from it as to not invite attention. 
They weren't ready to be popular just yet. The duo worked their way to the side of the fence with the parking lot in sight. There were a couple dozen zombies wandering around it, but they still hadn't noticed them. The two soldiers studied the area, spotting a couple of high-end trucks near the centre of the lot, about fifty yards past the fence, right in the thick of the ghouls. "'What do you think, Sarge?' Moss asked. "'Those trucks in the mile look like our best bet.' Copeland nodded slowly. "'Given the other vehicles look like beater cars, yeah.' he agreed. If anything is going to have an alarm, it'll be those trucks. And if we strike out? Moss asked, taking a deep breath. We break some windows and lay on the horn as long as we can, Copeland instructed. Won't be quite as loud as an alarm, but should do the trick. Moss raised his gun. We're weapons hot, right? he asked. The sergeant shook his head. Not until we set the alarm off, he declared. I thought the whole point of this exercise was to draw attention to ourselves, Moss asked, brow furrowed. Do you really want to do that before we get an alarm going? Copeland asked dryly. Moss paused for a beat and then nodded. Yeah, yeah, you're right, he agreed. I swear, though, once that car goes off, I'm lighting up whatever is within sight of me. You and me both, soldier, Copeland agreed. The two men got ready to move, drawing their knives and running up to the fence. There wasn't a zombie within thirty yards, so they had time to operate. Copeland jumped up, getting a firm grip before using his blade to slice the barbed wire at the top and free it. Moss did the same on the other side, and they shared a glance, sinking up and pulling off a five-yard section and tossing it to the ground. Up and over, let's move, Copeland urged and threw his legs over, landing on the ground and then assuming a fighting stance. Moss thumped down beside him, and they began to move. The noise attracted a few ghouls, but they were still thirty yards away. Their moans attracted the attention of a few others in the lot, which was about fifty yards away. They'd have to be fast. Let's get to those trucks, Copeland said, and they took off running. Before long they hit the pavement, footsteps echoing with the loud impact of their boots. They each picked an aisle around the vehicles in the lot, and Copeland kept his attention on potential hiding creatures as he moved quickly. He was the first to encounter a zombie, jamming his blade into the side of its head and tossing it aside. Moss was up next, grabbing a ghoul by the shirt and shoving it backwards, throwing it aside to keep moving. They each had a few more encounters, but the ghouls were spread out in the lot and not too much of a threat. Copeland noticed, though, that with each one they dropped, they drew the attention of several more in every direction. When he reached the target trucks, he could tell they were in pristine condition, like they'd just rolled off the lot. The owners had been quite proud of them, it seemed. "'You clear?' the sergeant asked. Moss stepped up to the front of a truck and violently jammed his blade into a zombie's eye socket before kicking it to the ground. Yeah, I'm good, he said, turning around. Let's hit it then, Copeland said, and got into position. Both men shoved the vehicles as hard as they could, jostling the shiny trucks with all their might. Within seconds, an ear-piercing alarm cut the air, and without even hesitating, the duo moved to the middle truck and began bouncing it setting it off as well. Copeland clambered up into the truck bed, looking toward the buildings. The noise seemed to be travelling well, with the majority of the ghouls turning and heading their way. A second later gunshots went off behind him and he whipped around. Moss unloaded on a few zombies and then shrugged sheepishly at the sergeant. What? he asked innocently. Told you I was going to light them up. Copeland spotted about twenty zombies filling in the aisles behind them, and aimed his rifle, squeezing off a few shots and dropping a few corpses. But the aisles continued to fill up. Gonna have to go up and over, he barked. Let's move. They took off running, leaping up onto the hood and running over the top, narrowly avoiding the outstretched arms of the creatures. The soldiers hit the ground and were essentially surrounded by zombies. Both men aimed their rifles ahead, opening fire at a batch of ghouls ahead of them. The shots ripped through their heads, dropping the corpses to the ground and clearing their way. When they reached the next cars and ran over them, they repeated the process on the next aisle. Within moments they were back at the grass with only a handful of creatures still ahead of them. 
Copeland stopped dead in his tracks, taking quick aim to put down the threat ahead. Moss joining him, they took care of it in mere seconds, and as soon as they were clear, they rushed to the fence, scaling it and landing safely back on the other side. Let's get out of sight, Copeland huffed. Too many of those things might collapse the fence. They ran away, finding some high grass to take cover in, lying low as they watched the zombies continue to head towards the trucks, even as one of the alarms fell silent. Hopefully that bought them enough of an opening to get through, the sergeant murmured. Bretts and Baker were ducked down in the high grass, waiting for the alarms to go off. There were about two dozen ghouls near the fence. The target building was fifty yards from the fence, with the fire escape at the corner. The truck alarms went off in the distance, followed quickly by gunshots. Guess that's our cue, Baker murmured. Bretts put a hand on his arm. Just give it a minute, he said. The duo watched as the majority of zombies started wandering towards the source of the noise, but there were still a dozen or so that were within ten yards of the fence, not at all interested in the alarms. The soldiers waited a full minute, but they were still not joining their friends. Shit, Baker grunted. Brett shook his head. Doesn't change anything. We still need to get in, he said firmly. By the time we cut away that barbed wire, they'll be on us, Baker said, shaking his head. Bretts took a deep breath. Not if you distract them and pull them away, he said. You want to go in there alone? Baker blurted. Want to? The corporal scoffed. No, but I don't see any other way. Baker let out a deep whoosh of breath. All right, I'm on distraction duty, he said. Go, Bretts commanded. Baker broke from cover, running up towards the fence. He reached it and began to smack on it, but not too loudly. He made just enough noise to gain the attention of the zombies close to him, not the ones walking away. Yeah, come say hello, he cooed, and shook the chain link softly, bringing the ghouls closer to him. As the alarms and gunfire in the distance died down, Bretts knew this was the only opening he would have, so he took off running. He sped about thirty yards away from where Baker's diversion was. He hopped up and quickly sliced a chunk of barbed wire free from its connection on the fence and pulled it away, hopping over and hitting the ground running. Luckily, it was nothing but grass on the other side, so his footsteps were overshadowed by Baker hitting the fence. The corporal wasted no time rushing over to the fire escape, keeping an eye on the zombies that were still walking away from him towards the now silent alarm. When he reached the fire escape, which was a set of stairs that ran up the side of the building, he took his time to move up quietly so he didn't create any noise. When he reached the top of the stairs, he looked back to see that Baker was holding the attention of the zombies well, and only a smattering of creatures outside of them were within view. Bretts readied his knife and reached for the door handle. He pushed down gently, relieved when it unlatched but then staggered backwards as soon as it flung open violently, a zombie snarling as it leapt to freedom. Brett was momentarily stunned at the sudden attack, his knife clattering to the stairs. He quickly recovered, grabbing the zombie by its belt and shoving his forearm into its chest. He struggled with it for a moment and then managed to turn it around and shove it towards the railing. He let out a grunt as he lifted it up, and then tossed it over, limbs flailing to the ground below. Bretts didn't wait around, grabbing his knife and immediately popping inside. He found himself on a second-floor catwalk that stretched the entire length of the building, with several crossings that ran along the other sides of the structure, so that people could walk across and inspect the machines. He stood at the ready, seeing a few creatures moving in the distance, but they weren't close enough to be a threat at the moment. Bretts looked over the railing to the factory floor below at dozens of shadowy creatures moving about. The skylights provided a little light, but not as much as he would like. He ignored them for the moment and focused on the machines. For the most part, they looked operational. Knowing his time was short, he figured he had enough information and headed back outside. The noise Baker had been making had drawn several ghouls back towards him, leaving a couple dozen between the edge of the building and the fence. Before he could even start down the stairs, several zombies took notice of him, 
moving towards the stairwell. Brett's ran down them, not even caring about the noise, and made it two-thirds of the way down as the first ghoul reached the base, several more directly behind it. The corporal leapt over the side railing, hitting the ground and stumbling forward. He gathered himself and started running, zombies hot in pursuit. The combination of the noise he was making and the zombie moans began to draw zombies away from Baker's diversion. The soldier on the other side of the fence pulled out his gun, firing a couple of rounds into some of the creatures' faces at point-blank range. But this did little to bring the creatures back towards him. They were locked in on Brett's. The corporal pumped his legs hard as the creatures moved towards him. There were a few that were close to his spot on the fence, with a lot more directly behind him. Baker! Brett bellowed. Help! The private tore from his spot, dropping his handgun and readying his rifle, lining up shots. He fired a trio of precise shots in quick succession, each one finding the back of a zombie's head. This gave the corporal just enough time to reach the fence, and he scurried up to the top like a startled squirrel up a tree. When he leapt over, he fell forward and landed flat on his face. Baker chuckled as he sauntered up. You all right there, corporal? he asked. Yeah, I'm good. Brett's groaned from the ground. And so are we. The place looks okay? Baker asked. Brett's nodded. Gonna take some work to clear it out, but it looks like a winner, he replied. Baker held out a hand to help up his comrade. Hell yeah. Let's go tell the captain and get the hell out of here, he said. Brett's took his hand and got to his feet. One down, five more to go, he said. They took off from the fence just as the mob reached it, pawing at the chain link. Brett's let hope curl inside of him a bit, satisfied by a tiny bit of good news from this otherwise bleak trip. Chapter 5 Kowalski jolted awake, his nose burning, and he flung his body back and forth, disoriented. He quickly realized that his hands were bound behind his back, and as his vision began to clear, he realized he was sitting up in the back of an SUV, buckled in and everything. A guy in the passenger seat sneered at him, clucking his tongue and poking the brim of his cowboy hat. Look alive, he drawled. We're almost at the kingdom. Despite the swimming of his head, Kowalski still found his sarcasm. The kingdom, he slurred. Doesn't sound pretentious at all. Mark it all you want, the cowboy snapped. But people are willing to go to great lengths to get past the front gates. Like your two friends in the back there. Kowalski blinked a few times and then craned his neck so he could see into the trunk of the SUV. Dennis and Karen were hogtied and gagged, staring up at him with looks of severe regret and fear. The sniper couldn't help but smirk a little. He was fucked, but at least they got their comeuppance for screwing him over. Must be pretty exclusive if you aren't letting riffraff like them in, Kowalski quipped. Oh, we're letting them in, the cowboy drawled with a mischievous twinkle in his eyes. But it's not going to be the experience they dreamed of. The sniper glanced over his shoulder. You hear that, guys? he asked. You fucked up. Hope it was worth it. He faced forward, and then something niggled in his brain. He wasn't gagged like the other two, and he got to sit in a seat. This could be good or very, very bad. So, he said, trailing off for a moment, Mr. Chosen Guy. Mitch, the cowboy supplied, turning to face the soldier. So, Mitch, Kowalski continued. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that since I don't look like a calf during a rodeo competition, that you have other plans for me. The cowboy nodded. Very astute, Mr. Kowalski. Though it sent a chill down his spine that they knew his name even, he kept his expression neutral. I have my moments, he said. Our leader, Ted Harris, wishes to have some words with you, Mitch explained. Since you and your friends took it upon yourselves to murder some of our people, after all. Kowalski rolled his eyes. 
Hey, now, that was self-defense, he insisted. That would hold up in any court of law. Maybe in the old world, Mitch quipped. Your mileage with that defense might vary in the kingdom's court. The sniper let out a soft sigh and stared out the window. There were several rows of barbed wire fencing, stretching for as far as he could see. Zombies thrashed against them, caught up and pissed, but many more lay lifeless against the traps. He looked out the front windshield as Mitch called in on his radio, announcing their arrival. A ten-foot-tall metal fence stood in front of an eight-foot-tall brick wall, double-stacked with elevated gunner positions in the middle. A large gate swung open, allowing the SUV to pull in. Once inside, Kowalski looked around at the high-end compound. It looked like a wealthy neighborhood that they'd converted into a fully functional society. Virtually every yard had greenhouses in them, every house had solar panels, and several armed guards watched as lesser people did the hard work tending to everything. Very homey, Kowalski mocked, assuming you grew up on a nineteenth-century plantation. We do what we have to in order to survive, Mitch snapped. Keep it up, and you'll be joining them. Amazingly enough, this is not the first time I've been threatened with slave labor, Kowalski quipped. Mitch ignored him, turning to the men walking up to them. Get the two out of the back and take them to processing, he barked. I've got this one. The men nodded and opened the trunk, dragging Dennis and Karen away. Mitch opened the back door and clicked open Kowalski's seatbelt, grabbing his arm and leading him in the opposite direction. Kowalski took the opportunity of their silent walk to look around. The fortifications of the double brick and metal wall were formidable, with guards standing on top of platforms built onto the brick so they could shoot over the top, with gunmen about every ten yards. He continued to look around, seeing close to a hundred gunmen, and three times as many non-chosen. Turning away from the wall, he looked down the next cross street, stretching so far he couldn't see the other side. You know, if it wasn't for the human rights violations, I'd say this is an impressive feat, he drawled, to get this many people this organized in such a short amount of time, and building this up as the world falls apart around you, not to mention all the resources you have out in town. If you knew anything about this city, then you'd know that anybody who managed to live in this neighborhood was well equipped to pull this off, Mitch replied, raising his chin. We have the knowledge, the will, and arguably most importantly, the fortifications to survive the first few days of chaos. Once the runners stopped running, it was a piece of cake to go out into the city and secure what we needed for our future, especially with our personnel. Kowalski pursed his lips. So the chosen are people who lived in this neighborhood? he asked. And select others we deemed important, Mitch added. The sniper sighed. Great, I'm dealing with the homeowners association from hell, he muttered. We're a little more formidable than that, the cowboy said. He led Kowalski to a large house on a corner lot. It was two stories and looked like it had been built in the last few years, surprisingly not as gaudy as the sniper had expected. Mitch nodded to the two armed guards standing on either side of the front door. Gentlemen, he greeted. We're here to see Mr. Harris. They nodded in response and opened the door for him, one of them leaning inside. Mr. Harris, your guest has arrived, he called. Kowalski crossed the threshold, ushered in by Mitch, and a man entered the front lobby. He was easily in his late fifties, but he was lean and muscular, not to mention tall. Ho! Oh, so you're the one giving my people so much trouble out there, he said brightly with a slickness like he was the unholy offspring of a televangelist and a used car salesman. "'Ted Harris, nice to meet you.' Kowalski blinked at him and then wiggled his wrists, the handcuffs jingling. After a brief moment of confusion, Ted realized what the problem was. "'Mitch, is this any way to treat our new friend here?' he asked. "'Come on, get those cuffs off.' "'Sir, I don't think that's wise,' the cowboy warned. Mitch, buddy, Ted said through a toothy smile. 
I didn't ask for your opinion on the subject. Now get those cuffs off and get into the kitchen. Marcy has a nice fresh pot of coffee brewing. He regarded the soldier. You like cream in yours? Don't worry, it's fresh. None of that powdered nonsense. We have some people under our protection who have a dairy farm. We don't have a lot of it, mind you, but happy to oblige you on this occasion. Kowalski cocked a brow. Normally I would tell you where to stick it, he said. But since I haven't had a proper cup of coffee since this began, I will take you up on your offer. He threw a glance at Mitch as the cowboy begrudgingly uncuffed him. Don't skimp on the cream there, Bubba, he gave him a wink as he wrinkled his nose and disappeared into the kitchen. Ted motioned for Kowalski to have a seat in the living room, and the soldier sat down on the couch, rubbing his wrists. So, I've been told that your name is Kowalski, Ted said, crossing one ankle over the opposite knee. Am I saying that right? You are, the soldier said. Ted grinned and spread his hands. Well, welcome to my humble abode, he said sweetly. Excuse the little bit of messiness. Marcy hasn't had all of her usual supplies to do a proper deep clean. I spent last night in a storage room, Kowalski said dryly. This is plenty clean. Well, hopefully this isn't your first trip to Boise, Ted continued, because I'd hate for that to be your initial impression of the town. The soldier sighed. I'll be honest, Ted, any city that has a budget for snowplows isn't a city that would ever win me over. Storage room accommodations or not, he admitted. Fair enough, sir. Fair enough, Ted replied with a chuckle. Mitch entered and set a coffee cup in front of each man on the table. Kowalski picked it up and made sure to stick his pinky up in a taunting manner as he slurped his up. Ted cocked his head at Mitch as he propped his mug on his thigh. Mitch, why don't you wait outside while we have our little chat? he asked. I get the impression that Mr. Kowalski here doesn't much care for you. He's right, you know, the soldier stage whispered, and the cowboy grumbled under his breath before heading outside to the porch. Once the door shut behind him, Ted took a deep breath. Okay, Mr. Kowalski, it's just the two of us, he said. So I'm going to get straight to the point. I need to know why you and your men are in my town. He raised a hand to keep the soldier from cutting in before he was finished. Now, before you answer, you should know that I'm not a stupid man. I know you're a highly trained and loyal soldier who would never do anything to endanger the mission. So I'm not expecting you to go full Bond villain and lay out your plan in detail, but... He held up a single finger and wagged it back and forth. You should know that I am also a very practical man. If I have something that can be of useful to the U.S. military, and can get something useful in return for providing it, I can be convinced to do so. A lot of people don't view you boys in the best of light, given how you up and abandoned us when we needed you most. And while I share some of that sentiment, I'm not going to let it get in the way of making a deal that would benefit me and this community. He took a sip of his coffee and then added, So, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and hear what you have to say. Kowalski nodded, drank a little more coffee, and then set the cup down, shaking his head. I'll say this, Ted, when somebody puts a quarter in you, they get the full twenty-five cents worth, he said. The other man let out a belly laugh and nodded. What can I say? he asked with a shrug. I never want anybody to feel cheated. Well, you'll have to forgive me for not going into specifics. However, as I'm sure you know, we recently liberated Seattle from the scourge of the undead, Kowalski began. Now, I'm sure you had some issues with supplies when starting this fine community up, so you can only imagine the difficulties of trying to do that with a few hundred thousand people. Ted cocked his head. Just thinking about the logistics of that makes me light-headed, he admitted. So, what sort of supplies? I mean, besides bullets. I didn't mention bullets, Kowalski said slowly. Oh, please, like I said, I'm not a stupid man, Ted scoffed. 
There's a reason my men were guarding that factory, because I know how important it is, and I'm willing to bet your superiors do too. Now, is there anything else on that list, or do you just want my bullets? Kowalski picked up the mug and downed the rest of the coffee, and let out a satisfied sigh. I'm going to make an executive decision and add cream to the list, he said wistfully. Life's too short to deal with powdered creamer. Indeed it is, good sir, Ted said with a grin. Indeed it is. He licked his lips and held up his finger again. Now, before I send you on your way, I do have another question for you. Kowalski nodded. More than welcome to ask it, he said. How big of a force do you have? The man inquired, a wry smile crossing his face. Big enough to make you wish you never messed with us the soldier replied, without missing a beat. He knew the importance of a convincing lie in that moment. Ted smirked and nodded, running his tongue over his teeth. He whistled loudly, and his cowboy entered. "'Mitch, I think Mr. Kowalski and I have finished chatting for the moment,' he drawled. The soldier sighed. "'And here I was, hoping for a refill on the coffee,' he said, staring down into his empty mug. "'Don't worry.' We'll be speaking again soon, Ted promised. What do you want me to do with him? Mitch asked. Ted waved a hand. Take him to the holding, he said. Kowalski put a hand over his heart and faux offense. Ah, oh, he whined. I thought we were friends there, Ted. Hang on, the chosen leader said, raising his palms. Mr. Kowalski, I hope you don't take this personally, but I can't have you roaming around on your own. However, Mitch here is going to put you in a private cell, partially because I want you to be able to stretch out, and partially because I've heard the people who turned you in are in the same holding area. Don't want to tempt you into revenge. Mitch pulled out the handcuffs and roughly grabbed Kowalski's arms, slapping the cuffs over his wrists and then shoving him towards the door. Mitch, a word, Ted said, waving him back. The cowboy pointed a finger in the soldier's face. You move, and we're taking a detour by the workshop so I can introduce your knee to a hammer, he snarled. Don't worry, Kowalski drawled. Not going anywhere without my escort. Mitch moved back into the living room, the two of them walking quietly, but the soldier straining his ears. Drop him off and get the negotiator over here, Ted was saying. Yes, sir, Mitch replied and then walked back towards the front door. "'Oh, and see if you can't get our friends down in Kuna on the line,' Ted called loudly enough for the soldier to hear. "'If we're going to be getting off on the right foot with our military friends, we should probably arrange for Mr. Kowalski to find his way back to his friends. Wouldn't you agree, Mitch?' The cowboy gritted his teeth. "'Yeah, I can do that, sir,' he said. Kowalski didn't buy it but smiled friendly as Mitch shoved him out the door. As they walked towards his cell, his mind began to race. For what felt like the millionth time in the last twenty-four hours, he knew he was in trouble. Chapter 6 Should be another half a mile or so, just around the curve, Zeke said as he poured over his map. Got two of them within a couple of miles. Well, we've already found one good one, but still, Kersey said, shaking his head. Would like to have a few more. He led the caravan around the curve, about thirty miles away from Kuna, to the far east side of town, and then promptly came to a halt. Well, so much for that, he muttered. They stared at the munitions factory, or at least, what was left of it. At some point, a huge fire had ripped through it, leaving only a handful of support beams still standing, as well as charred corpses on the ground. Brett's leaned forward from the back, letting out a low whistle. Looks like we missed a hell of a show, Cap, he said. Kersey took a deep breath. Zeke, I'm guessing this didn't happen before the world collapsed, he asked. No, I'm pretty sure it would have made the news if it did, came the reply. Not that I followed the news all that closely, but pretty sure I would have seen this. Baker looked through a pair of binoculars at the wreckage. Captain, we need to go check that out, 
he piped up. You see something? Kersey asked, cocking his head. I think I do, Baker replied. The captain nodded. Okay, then, just be on alert, he instructed, and popped the truck back into gear, driving towards the burned-out building. As they got closer, Kersey saw what had caught Baker's attention. There was light smoke coming up from underneath some of the rubble. He parked the vehicle and got out with the corporal and Zeke in tow, walking towards the perimeter of the building with several fires still lightly burning. This had to have been recent, Bretz breathed, last day or so. Kersey shook his head. If it was deliberate, then they must know what we're after, he said. What kind of maniac would destroy it rather than let us get it? the corporal asked, throwing up his hands. Zeke, is the leader of the Chosen like that? Kersey asked, turning to his companion. Zeke shook his head. No, he's a lot more pragmatic than that, he replied. I can't see him destroying the ammunition. I'm not so sure he did, Kersey replied slowly. Look around. What do you see? The other two scanned the area, spotting only a collapsed building that looked like it had fallen in on itself. There's no explosive debris, Bretz mused. If ammunition was detonated, then there would be parts of this building hundreds of yards out. This place is just... burned. How close is that other factory? the captain asked. Mile or so? Zeke replied. Kersey shook his head. One place is easier to defend than two, he said. Bretz took a deep breath. If that's the case, then we could be in for a fight, he said. What direction is the factory in? Kersey asked, and Zeke pointed to the northeast, across a field with high grass and a thick patch of trees that blocked the view of the next building. Okay, we drive up to that tree line and then go from there on foot. If they are holed up there, we don't want to give ourselves away. Bretz and Zeke nodded and they made their way back to the trucks, relaying the information to the others. They quickly fired up the vehicles and drove across the field, stopping just short of the tree line. Copeland, Dawson, recon, Kersey said. Go. The soldiers in question nodded and took off into the woods, leaving the rest behind. Zeke, Baker, Moss, Kersey continued. I want you to stay by the trucks. If we get pinned down, you're our cavalry. Baker nodded sharply. That road goes right around to the factory, right? He asked. Yeah, straight shot, Zeke confirmed. If shit goes sideways, we'll be coming in hot for an escape route for you, Baker promised. The captain nodded. Let's hope it doesn't come to that, he said. You still have hope that shit won't go sideways? Baker joked. Cap, I gave that up after that small town with the homicidal high school quarterback. Kersey simply smirked as he motioned for the others to follow him into the woods. They moved quickly, but stayed quiet. As they went along something resembling a path, there was a trail of dead bodies on the ground, all with stab wounds to the head. Johnson let out a soft clicking noise, motioning for the other two to come over to one of the creatures. Kersey and Bretts approached, the corporal bending down to tug on a chain on the ground. It was attached to the zombie's ankle, leading over to a nearby tree. They got these things on a leash now? Bretz asked, but before anyone could respond, there was a shuffling sound to the right of them. Kersey spotted a zombie shambling towards them, or at least trying to. Past it, deeper into the woods, were even more corpses, staggering in place. Either that's one hell of a coincidence, Johnson trailed off. Or somebody is setting up a zombie minefield, Bretz finished. Come on, let's find Copeland, Kersey said, and continued to move through the woods. The trio eventually caught up to Copeland and Dawson kneeling by the edge of the woods. The latter noticed them and motioned for the soldiers to duck down. Kersey did so and sidled up next to them. Status? he asked quietly. I don't think they're very fond of visitors, Copeland murmured. Kersey surveyed the area. The factory was about two hundred yards away, without fifty yards of tall grass directly in front of them. Past that, into the regular field, there were about a hundred zombies tethered to posts, with three or four on each wooden one, wandering about. 
There was barely enough room between them for someone to walk through. So much for a surprise attack, Johnson muttered. As soon as we start approaching, those things are going to get riled up. We'll be easy pickings. Dawson cocked his head. Doesn't look like the guards go all the way around the complex, he mused. Maybe we could approach from the rear. Kersey raised his binoculars, peering at the back of the factory. We have no cover back there, he said. As soon as we're out in the open, somebody is going to notice us, especially with the hundreds of yards we'd have to cover to get around the zombie field. He handed the binoculars to Brett's. Ideas? he asked as the corporal scanned the area for a way in. We got the trucks, Copeland suggested. Set a couple for ramming speed, crash through the front gate, and take our chances? Dawson shook his head. And if it was anything like the last factory, we'd get torn up in seconds, he replied. Hell, they even know we're coming this time, so we have to assume they're ready for that. Diversion and flank? Johnson asked. Get those things in front of us riled up while the rest get around back. So nice of you to volunteer to be bait, Johnson, Dawson drawled. The private hesitated. Oh, I mean, he stammered. Yeah, I guess I could. Or we could ambush the two assholes dragging out some more zombies, Bretts interrupted. Everyone turned their attention towards the front gate as Bretts handed the binoculars to Kersey. The captain looked, spotting two men hauling a trio of zombies behind them out of the factory. The corpses had protective headgear on, so they couldn't bite their captors. He scanned the area, spotting a post about twenty yards from the edge of the tall grass near the road that didn't currently have any zombies, which was one of the few that was empty. Copeland, Dawson, Johnson, get ready to approach from the rear, Kersey murmured. Bretts and I are going to have a chat with these two. The trio stayed ducked down, moving quickly towards the back of the complex while staying concealed in the tree line. Bretts and Kersey crawled on the ground, keeping their bodies below the tall grass. They worked their way up about fifty yards or so, stopping at the edge of the grass. The wooden post was about twenty yards from them, and they watched the two men stop in front of it. The ghouls chained to other posts grew agitated, reaching out for the live meal but they were out of reach. One worked to secure the chains to the post, and the other kept them corralled, shoving the ghouls backwards into one another to keep them away. You got these things secure yet? The wrangler huffed. Yeah, yeah, keep your pants on, the guy at the post shot back. Yes, please do. That's not a sight I need to see, Kersey declared, and the two men startled as the captain aimed his rifle at them and Bretts rushed out from the grass. The man by the post tried to draw his weapon, but was quickly tackled to the ground by a charging Bretts, leaving him dazed and bloodied. The corporal ripped the weapon from its holster and threw it aside before using the chains to wrap him up. The other man struggled with the zombies, unable to raise his weapon. Kersey approached him, rifle still aimed, and stood on the other side of the ghouls, putting them between him and the man. He reached up and unlatched one of the masks on a creature. Oh my God, what are you doing? The man cried in a panic, eyes widening. Getting your attention, Kersey replied simply. Now, you have that one at bay, but I guarantee you'll have a hell of a time if I unleash the other two. So I suggest you answer my questions. The captain kept his hand on the back of the ghoul he'd unleashed, shoving it forward into the other two the man struggled with. "'Jesus Christ, man!' the guy screamed. "'Please, put its mask back on!' Kersey shook his head. "'Not until you tell me what I want to know,' he said. "'Okay, okay!' the man cried. "'What do you want?' "'How many people you got in there?' the captain asked. "'Skeleton crew! Only half a dozen counting us!' the man gushed. Kersey stared him down, not buying how quickly he'd offered up the number and doubting its authenticity. What do you think, Corporal? he drawled. Is he telling the truth? Seems a bit convenient for my taste, Bretts replied. Small enough number to make us think we could take him. I'm betting there's at least twice as many men in there. No, I swear, the panicked man cried. There's only the seven of us. Kersey pursed his lips. Seven, huh? he asked. Somebody give birth in there while we were having this little chat? 
because a second ago it was only half a dozen. The guy shook his head rapidly, squeezing his eyes shut. Six, seven, who gives a shit? He blurted. You're not going in there with just the two of you, so what's it matter? Finally, a bit of honesty from you, Kersey said. Still, I would like an accurate number. He pushed the unmasked zombie to the side so he could reach over and flick open another one. Oh God, oh God, the man cried, struggling to keep them in place, especially now that one of them had access to his arm. He gripped the back of its neck, pushing its head back. Okay, there's twelve, now please help me. That sounds a little more realistic, Brett said and pulled out his walkie-talkie. Copeland, you copy? We're in position, the sergeant replied. What's the status? About to raise some hell out here, Bretts replied. Most likely a dozen hostiles inside. Not for long, Copeland quipped. Bretts smirked and inclined his head to Kersey. I like him, he said, and then held the walkie-talkie back up to his mouth. Stand by. The captain reached out and unlatched the last masked zombie, and the man's eyes went wide as saucers. Come on, I told you what you wanted to know he screamed. Kersey nodded. Yep, you did, he said calmly. But still, you work for a group that is actively trying to kill innocent people, not to mention my own people, so I can't just let you go either. The wrangler let out a sob, his expression betraying his fear that this was it for him. After a beat of letting him wallow in that, Kersey pulled out his knife and stabbed the back of each of the zombie's skulls in quick succession. As soon as the corpses dropped to the ground, he aimed his rifle at the stunned man. You take that gun out, nice and slow, Kersey demanded. Toss it into that group of zombies to the right. The man complied, slowly drawing his handgun and throwing it over, the piece landing in between four ghouls tethered to a pole. Bretz picked up the other man, holding the back of his collar and shoving him in front of him. Kersey did the same with his captive. Here's what's going to happen he said, voice low and menacing. You're going to lead us through this zombie minefield and up to the front gate. Once you let us in, we'll let you go on your merry way. The two zombie wranglers looked at each other and shrugged. Okay, you're going to need to stay close, Kersey's man said. There's not a lot of room between the zombie posts. Lead the way, the captain replied with a nod. But let me be very clear. If you try to get cute, Try to mislead us into the grasp of a zombie? You're getting fed to them, understand? Yep, the man replied, voice shrill. Understand perfectly. Come on. They moved in single file, the factory gate about a hundred and fifty yards away. In that space, there were easily a hundred zombies in front of them, all hungry and excited. They started walking, the lead man weaving them in and around the outstretched arms of the dead. Kersey kept a close watch on them, making sure each and every chain was secure on the legs of the beasts. Zombie guard dogs, really? Bretz asked. Whose bright idea was that? Conrad, his captive replied, shaking his head. After you boys shot up his men the last time, he felt like we needed to protect our interests. The soldiers stiffened. Conrad's here, Bretz demanded. The wrangler stammered, no words coming out of his mouth. Mikely realizing he'd just royally screwed up by mentioning his boss by name. Bretz shook him a little. I'll ask again, he snapped. Conrad is here? The man didn't respond, which caused the corporal to growl. One shove and your dinner, Bretz threatened, motioning to a pack of zombies less than two yards away. You understand that, right? That's enough, corporal, Kersey cut in. If he's here, we'll find him but we need to stay focused on getting through this minefield. He knew emotions were running high. Conrad had straight up murdered one of their own. But they had to get to him before they could exact their revenge. Bretz begrudgingly agreed, staying on course behind them. About halfway through the pack, the zombies were still enraged that they were so close to warm flesh. A brief moment later, there was a loud clanking sound in the distance, quickly followed by another. Kersey stopped. Listen, he said. A few more clinks later, the soldiers looked at each other, confused. The man Bretz was leading went pale, eyes terrified. 
What is it? the captain demanded. The locks, the man hissed. Kersey glanced at the closest post and realized that the lock holding the chains together was electronic. It dawned on him that someone could free them from a distance, just as that lock beeped and clicked open, freeing the ghouls. They're loose, he bellowed. Move! The clinking of chains continued as they pushed through the mob. Behind them, dozens of zombies they'd passed were now free and shambling after them. Whoever had started freeing them had started at the back and worked their way up. Kersey let go of his man so they could focus on running. When they reached within fifty yards of being free from the pack and into the twenty or so yards between them and the fence, the ghouls in front had broken free and filled the gap. Lower your shoulder and push through, Kersey bellowed. I got your back. Okay, the man cried and did as instructed, lowering his shoulder. Just before he could smack into a small batch of zombies, a shot rang out and a bullet punched through his shoulder, sending him tumbling to the grass. The man landed right at the feet of a few zombies, and the corpses immediately pounced on him, ripping into his flesh as he screamed in terror and pain. It happened so quickly that Kersey barely had time to react, and it was all he could do to just keep running. He slammed his shoulder into a ghoul, sending it back into the crowd to give them some room to run. Bretz's man stopped dead to try to pull the zombies off of his friend, and the corporal shoved him. He's gone! Move! Bretz cried, tearing off after Kersey. The man let out a frustrated scream before taking off after the soldiers, but a good ten yards behind. They skidded to a stop on the other side, glancing back to see the man vanish behind a wall of rotting flesh. Another shot went off the bullet smacking the ground next to Brett's feet. The fence was another twenty yards ahead of them, with nothing but open field, leaving them severely exposed. "'Get shields!' Kersey yelled. Both soldiers grabbed a zombie with each arm, shoving them backwards while straining to hold them upright. Shots continued to come their way, some hitting the ground and others hitting the ghouls they pushed, narrowly missing them. When they got closer to the fence, Kersey barked, Shove him forward and lay down cover fire. Bretz did as instructed, and Kersey took over as the corporal fired back towards the factory. For a few moments, bullets stopped coming, giving the captain enough time to shove one of his zombies to the ground and the other into Bretz's too, holding the trio in place against the fence. He waited patiently for the one he'd knocked down to stagger to its feet and come at him. Kersey grabbed its arm once it was within reach and jerked it towards him, spinning it around and shoving it face first into the back of one of the zombies against the fence. Bretz! he cried. The corporal stopped firing and dove forward, throwing himself against the other side of the zombie shield his companion had created. The two of them pressed themselves against the backs of the quartet of undead, keeping them pinned and protecting them from bullets. Now what, Cap? Bretz huffed. Kersey raised his walkie-talkie to his lips. Copeland, we're exposed and have a shooter on the— A shot rang out, the bullet piercing through one ghoul and into another one, sending dark blood spraying everywhere. Find him quick, or we're toast, Kersey urged. On it, Captain. Copeland came back. Kersey raised his rifle back towards the horde that was slowly marching their way, only about twenty-five yards from the fence. Pick your targets and slow them down. Kersey instructed, pressing his back against their flailing shield. Bretz did the same beside him, and the two soldiers began shooting. They took down zombies with precision, strategically dropping corpses that would trip up the others. Kersey kept his eyes on the prize, shoving down his worry as bullets continued to smack into their zombie barricade. Copeland, you better hurry, he thought. Chapter 7 Copeland, Dawson, and Johnson were on the back end of the complex, off to the side, still concealed by the trees. It was about a sixty-yard run to the back fence, and from their vantage point they could see three armed guards looking around, spread out by twenty yards. "'That's going to be a hell of a run if they can't distract them,' Dawson said. Copeland shook his head. If they can't, though, we need a plan of action, he said. We're getting in there one way or another. I'm all ears, Sarge, Dawson said with a sigh. 
Johnson, you any good with that rifle? The sergeant asked. The private shrugged. I'm not going to be sniping them from half a mile away like Kowalski or Wade, but I'm pretty confident I can hit a target from this distance, he replied. Or get close enough to make them find cover. I can live with that, Copeland said with a nod. So, if it comes to it, rifle shots went off in the distance, and the soldiers shared a glance. Doesn't look like it's going to, Johnson said. A couple more shots went off, but the trio of men didn't move inside the factory fencing. That's not good, Dawson muttered. After several tense moments, the gunfire intensified. We're going to have to make a move, Copeland said, and took a deep breath. Copeland, we're exposed and have a shooter on the— Cursey came through the walkie-talkie, but another shot cut him off. Find him, quick, or we're toast. On it, Captain, Copeland replied into the radio and slung his rifle over his shoulder, drawing his handgun. Take care of the guards, follow me in, and for the love of God, don't shoot me in the back. Before either of them could respond, he broke from cover, running at full tilt towards the fence. Shit! Dawson hissed, and the two privates scrambled to their feet and readied their rifles, taking aim at the guards on the other side of the fence. Copeland ran full speed ahead, and the guards took notice firing a couple of shots at him that narrowly missed. Dawson aimed and fired first, managing to hit one of the gunmen in the chest, sending him to the ground. This caused the man next to him to stop shooting for a moment, looking over at his dying friend. Before he could turn and start firing again, Johnson hit his target, the gunman on the other side of him. The panicked man stared at his other friend's dropping corpse, before aiming his rifle back towards the charging Copeland. Before he could fire, the sergeant did, squeezing off a couple dozen rounds as he approached the fence. Most of them missed since he was running, and still a good thirty yards from the target. But one managed to punch the man in the shoulder, spinning him around and to the ground. Copeland hit the fence hard, leaping up halfway before latching on and quickly scurrying over, landing hard and immediately ducking into a combat roll, partially to soften the impact but also because the wounded gunman was raising his weapon. The sergeant sprang to his feet, unloading two more shots into the man's chest, ending the threat. Copeland drew his rifle, quickly surveying the area for more threats as the gunshots intensified at the front of the complex. He turned to see the other two soldiers tearing towards the fence, but more gunshots went off, and bullets impacted the ground beside their feet, coming from a high angle. Copeland spun around, scanning the roof line and second floor before finally spotting a gun barrel sticking out of a window. He moved as far back as he could to get the best angle, and then opened fire, sending two three-round bursts in the gunman's direction, impacting just below the windowsill. He didn't know if he hit his target, but the gun disappeared inside of the building, which ended the immediate threat to Johnson and Dawson at least. He scanned around as the others hopped over the fence and moved up to his position. You two, clear the factory floor, he instructed. I'm going to go find out who is giving the captain trouble. The two soldiers nodded and took off for the nearby door. Johnson put his hand on the handle as Dawson got into position, and after a quick silent countdown, he flung it open so Dawson could rush inside. Gunshots rang out immediately, and Dawson dove to the right behind cover, as Johnson remained outside, using the doorframe for cover and peeking inside. There were five men spread out across the floor, aiming and shooting at Dawson. Johnson took aim at the leftmost person, firing while rushing inside and diving to the left, making it behind cover as the gunman attempted to hit him as well. "'Hey, you good?' Johnson called. Dawson got into a seated position as he readied his gun, nodding at his companion that he was okay. Got four more, at least, Johnson reported. His companion grinned. Better get to it, then, he said. They both waited for a break in the gunfire, and then popped up to return fire. Most of the gunmen hid, but Dawson managed to drop one of them with a bullet to the shoulder. The enemy was still spread out fairly well, making it difficult to concentrate the fire. They exchanged a few more rounds before Johnson grunted. This ain't working, he said. Your call, Dawson invited him. Cover me, Johnson said. With a nod, Dawson whirled around the corner of his cover 
and opened fire, emptying the rest of his magazine three rounds at a time. While the chaos erupted, Johnson made a run for it, getting to the outer wall so he could flank the other men. While they focused on returning fire towards Dawson, Johnson picked his first target, shooting him in the side of the head without ever seeing it coming. This let the soldier move up to his position, picking out the next one in line and firing, this time hitting him in the chest as he turned at the last second. The last remaining enemy turned and fired a few shots towards Johnson, which forced him behind cover. When he emerged again, the gunman was gone. We got a runner, he yelled, and saw Dawson break from cover, coming up the opposite flank. He made the turn to the outer wall moving up and spotted the fleeing man about fifty yards up, standing outside the fenced-in area with his hand on the gate. Dawson aimed to fire, but the man had time to flip the gate open and run. He hit the man on the shoulder, but before he could fire again, a couple dozen zombies poured out of the open gate. "'Johnson, we got trouble!' Dawson bellowed. The private skidded next to him, shaking his head in disbelief. "'Where the fuck did they come from?' he demanded over Dawson's firing. "'Dumbass open the gate!' his companion replied. I guess to throw us off his trail. Johnson gaped at him. You let him get away? Dawson held up a finger, ceasing his shooting. Screams echoed over the moaning of the approaching ghouls. Let's just hope they eat enough of him that we don't have to deal with the runner, Johnson grunted. Here's hoping, Dawson agreed, and then motioned to the horde. Shall we? he asked. Johnson nodded. We shall. The two men aimed their rifles at the slowly moving pack picking their targets and squeezing the trigger like they were at target practice. The closest ghoul was about thirty yards away, and that was as close as Johnson intended to let them get. Meanwhile, Copeland raced around the side of the factory, listening to the rifle shots going off above him. He looked out towards the fence, seeing the mini-zombie wall that Kersey and Brett's constructed. A bullet ripped through one of the creature's chest and the sergeant glanced past them at the horde of zombies headed their way, some dropping from his friends shooting them. I gotta get up there, or else this is going to get ugly, he thought to himself, and scanned the area. There was a fire escape about forty yards down, and he raced towards it. Another shot went off close by, and he pulled out his knife, not wanting to risk giving away his position. As he approached, another rifle shot went off from the other side of a storage building, just on the other side of the walkway, in front of the building. He stopped at the back of it, looking around the side and seeing a man reloading a hunting rifle. Copeland moved slowly towards him, without being detected, and threw his hand across the man's mouth before drawing the blade quickly across his neck. The man gurgled blood for a moment, before falling limp, and Copeland dropped him to the ground. Another rifle shot went off from above, and he snapped back to the mission at hand. The sergeant raced up the fire escape, reaching the second floor. He gently opened the door, peeking his head inside and looking back towards the shooter. Two men positioned by the window, each of them taking turns aiming and firing. It was about a forty yards run to get to them, so he had to pick his time to move. The man closest to him was portly, easily over two hundred pounds. Copeland waited until the man closest to him fired and pulled back into reload. As soon as he did, the sergeant broke from the doorway, running as hard as he could towards the enemy. His heavy boots on the metal floor echoed throughout the building, evident even over the zombie moans and constant gunfire. The enemy turned and saw him rushing up, and dropped his rifle in shock, reaching for a handgun in his side holster. Copeland opened fire with his own handgun, smacking the man in the chest three times. He slumped back, and his friend caught him, the dead weight pinning him to the ground and his rifle falling to the side. The sergeant rushed him, putting his foot on the dead gunman and aiming his handgun at the head of the other shooter. "'You just stay right there,' he warned, and then leaned towards the window. "'Captain, we're good!' he yelled. "'Get your ass in here!' He watched as the duo quickly executed their zombie shield and then scaled the fence which, luckily, didn't have barbed wire on it. They hit the ground, laying there for a few moments to catch their breath, as the zombies they were fending off got to the gate. Copeland turned to his captive, still pinned beneath the weight of the dead man, 
and the sergeant's boot. Okay, I surrender, the man groaned. Now can you get this guy off of me? You'll be all right, Copeland drawled. I'd be more worried about the fact my captain is about to come up here and whoop your ass for taking shots at him and his friend. The gunman gulped, clear on his face that he knew he was in trouble. At the sound of Copeland's whistle, Kersey led Brett's up a set of stairs and laid eyes on the sergeant, a grin spreading on his face when he saw just who he had pinned on the floor. Should have known you were the asshole taking shots at us, Kersey said as they approached. Not to mention trying to feed us to your guard dogs there, Brett added. Conrad grunted under the weight. Captain, good to see you again, he managed to say as brightly as ever. Feeling ain't mutual, bud, Brett's quipped. Before we get to the inevitable interrogation, allow me to offer my condolences, Conrad said with a sneer. I heard you lost another man. Kersey was in no mood to be trifled with. He drew his handgun and aimed it at Conrad's head. Make another comment like that and see what happens, he snarled. The pinned man raised his free hand. No offense intended, Captain, he said voice sugary sweet. I was just merely going to say my condolences for losing another man. But you should rejoice, because we found him. The soldiers exchanged worried glances, stunned into silence. If you ask me nicely, Conrad drawled, I'll give you our radio frequency. Mr. Harris just might be interested in getting me back. Kersey clenched his jaw and then holstered his gun. Sergeant, get that man ready to move, he barked, and then waved for Bretts to follow him away. Yes, sir, Copeland replied. Bretts leaned in to the captain, lowering his voice. Think he's telling the truth about Kowalski? he asked. How else would he know he was missing? Kersey murmured back. Maybe one of the guys you escaped from spotted him? Bretts suggested. The captain shook his head. Perhaps, he admitted. But if there's a chance they've got him, he trailed off helplessly, not wanting to let himself hope. You know it's going to be a trap, right? Bretts reminded him. Kersey sighed. Usually is, he agreed. Copeland approached with Conrad in tow, trust and secured. We're ready to move, he said. Just need to know where we're going. Not the front gate, that's for damn sure, Bretts quipped. How was the back looking? Kersey asked. Copeland nodded. Nothing but an open field, he replied. Kersey drew his walkie-talkie. Baker, come in, he said. Hey, Captain, how's it looking in there? The private came back. Kersey took a deep breath. We're alive, he replied. That's a good start, Baker said. Hang on, Kersey said, and then leaned over the railing to the floor of the factory, where Dawson and Johnson were sweeping the area. How are we looking? the captain called down. This place is filled with everything we need, Dawson called back. Looks like they cleared out the other place and brought everything here. Good, Kersey called. Lock it up tight and head to the back. We're getting out of here. He turned to Conrad and narrowed his eyes. And before you get any bright ideas about retaking this place, just know we have a small army ready to occupy and hold it. And I assure you, my shooters are better than yours. He motioned to the dead man next to them. Yes, sir, Captain, Conrad said with a ghost of a smirk on his face. Kersey didn't like it, but they were short on time. Baker, come up the road and head around to the back, he instructed into the radio. We'll be ready to move in five. Yes, sir, Baker replied. Let's move, Kersey said. Time to get Kowalski back. Chapter 8 Kowalski sat in his cell across from Dennis and Karen, the couple slumped over and looking incredibly depressed. The soldier couldn't help but smirk and shake his head. So, how'd that whole kidnapping and trying to sell me into slavery thing go for you? He drawled. Dennis shook his head. My un... Look, I'm sorry we... Fucked up? Kowalski cut in. Yeah, I bet you are sorry. People usually are when they realize their plan backfired on them and they're facing the consequences of their actions. Come on, 
cut us some slack? Karen whined. You have no idea what we've been through. The sniper rolled his eyes. Oh, I'm just a soldier who has been out on the front lines of this thing since day one, riding a train halfway across the goddamn country, fighting all manner of assholes, both living and dead, he said, tone thick with mocking. Dealing with lack of food, lack of supplies, lack of shelter. Hell, I'd give up my right nut to have spent the last month in the comfort you two had. Before they could respond, two guards walked in with a third man trailing behind them, wearing a white lab coat with a canvas case under one arm. Oh, and look, Kowalski drawled. Thanks to you, now I'm about to be tortured. Karen and Dennis looked down at the floor but the three men quickly blocked the soldier's view of them, demanding attention. The man in the lab coat looked to be in his early fifties, his lanky form almost corpse-like as he loomed over the sitting soldier. Now, now, Mr. Kowalski, the torture only happens if you don't answer my questions, he said sweetly, the fluorescent lights shining off of his bald head. If you do, then it's just a friendly little chat. Hope you're happy with yourselves, Kowalski called, leaning over to address Dennis and Karen. I'm going to call this asshole every name under the sun, question his lineage, and insinuate I know his mother, wife, and sister in a biblical sense. So in the next half hour, I could very well be dead. You, on the other hand, will be stuck here as slaves, working your fingers to the bone so these jack wagons can live a life of luxury or as close to one as you can get in this zombie hellscape. He winked as Karen whimpered. As fucked up as my situation is, I wouldn't trade spots with you. He smirked as the cell door opened, even though he knew he was in for a rough time. His only consolation was that he had the power to make sure the people who put him in this position hated life just a little bit more, and he felt he'd taken full advantage. Okay, boys, where we going? He drawled, voice casual, despite his heart rate picking up. The lab-coated man stepped back so the guards could grab Kowalski and lead him out of the holding area and across the hallway into a darkened room. On the far side was a small table next to a St. Andrew's cross. Somebody in this town was kinky, the soldier quipped. Secure him, the lab-coated man demanded. The two guards moved Kowalski to the X-crossed wood, strapping his wrists and ankles to it so he stood there, spread-eagled. He winked at the one closest to him. My safe word is Rosebud, he said. The guards ignored him, moving to stand on either side of the door as the man in the lab coat approached. He set his canvas case on the table and then stood in front of Kowalski, nose to nose. Mr. Kowalski, my name is Joshua he said. Tell me, what I want to know, and this will be a pleasant experience for you. Rebuff my questions, however. He reached over and unrolled the case, revealing an impressive collection of knives, scalpels, and other shiny painful-looking tools. Kowalski nodded thoughtfully. So, did you order the Psychopath starter kit online, or is that something you put together yourself? he asked. Joshua clucked his tongue, eyes no longer amused. You don't take things very seriously, do you, Mr. Kowalski? he asked. I know guys like you. I can see that look in your eye, the soldier replied. It doesn't matter what I say, you're going to get your pound of flesh regardless. If I don't talk, you'll carve me up to get me to talk. If I do talk, you'll carve me up to make sure I'm telling you the truth. So just do whatever it is you're going to do, because this whole good maniac, bad maniac routine is played out. Joshua sneered. As you wish, he hissed, and then ran his fingers almost lovingly across his tools. He selected a small scalpel and then snapped his fingers. Guards, his shirt. One of them came over and ripped the soldier's t-shirt right down the front leaving the two halves hanging from his armpits. Hope you have a tailor in town, Kowalski quipped. That shit was custom. Joshua lashed out, and the soldier hissed at the six-inch slice running horizontally across his chest, just below his nipple. 
Now that I have your attention, his captor said, what is your force size? Kowalski tilted his head back and forth, as if he were thinking about it. Somewhere north of your mom's weight, which clearly shows we outnumber you, he drawled. And before you say anything, I know I said I know your mother biblically. But what can I say? I'm a chubby chaser. He grinned and tried to stifle a grimace as Joshua cut into him again, this time a little deeper and a little longer. What is your force size? he asked. Kowalski clucked his tongue. Somewhere north of your sister's weight? he quipped. Joshua slashed him again, this time to form an X across his chest. What is your force size? he demanded. Larger than... Yours. The soldier let the words come out slow and deliberate, even allowing venom to seep in. Joshua smirked and took a step back to admire his handiwork. Ah, so we're done with the petty insults, he said, making progress. He ran his fingers along the tools again, this time stopping on a small handsaw. He held it up, letting it glint in the dim light. A few cuts on your chest, and you're speaking almost rationally. I wonder what your response to losing a finger or two will be. Kowalski balled his hands up into tight fists, and Joshua reached up to try to pry one of them open to no avail. Guards! he called over his shoulder. I need your assistance. Nobody approached, and his brow furrowed. Didn't take long for them to get tired of your shit, Kowalski quipped. Joshua ignored him and walked out into the hallway. How dare you leave me in— He stopped short and cleared his throat. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Joshua, it's okay, Ted said from the hallway, and Kowalski strained his ears, his interest peaked. I'm the one who should be apologizing. I know how once you get going, it hurts the process for you to be interrupted. And believe me, I wouldn't have done it without a very good reason. He paused. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume he hasn't given you much of anything. Just making rude comments about my mother's weight, Joshua said dryly, and Kowalski snorted. That is unfortunate, Ted replied. I hope you extracted a little bit of pain for that slight. I did, Joshua replied, impatience evident in his tone. Now please, sir, tell me what this interruption is about so I can get back to it. Old buddy, now please don't be mad at me. But I'm going to have to pull the plug on your little conversation you're having with Mr. Kowalski, Ted said, and the soldier's body slumped with relief. Joshua grunted. Sir? he demanded. Don't take it personal. I know full well you are capable of getting me the answers I need. Ted assured him. However, a new opportunity came up, and I'm gonna take it. Kowalski's mind raced, his heart leaping with hope. Had his comrades found him? Were they planning some kind of rescue? Was he getting out of this hellhole without dying at the hands of a sadistic madman? Now see, Conrad's gone and gotten himself captured by these invaders, and they kinda called us offering a trade, Ted continued. Joshua sighed. Prisoner exchange? he asked. Exactly, Ted replied. Now it's my belief these boys aren't working with a big crew, and if my hunch is right, we'll not only be able to confirm that fact, but we just might be able to take them all out when we do the exchange. Kowalski's blood boiled, but he had to be smart about this. The captain had faced smarter and more ruthless assholes than this one. As we speak, Mitch is putting together a sizable strike force and heading out to the old O'Neill place about halfway between here and Kuna, Ted continued. Unless they show up in force, they're going to have a surprise on their hands once we get Conrad back. And if that doesn't work, Joshua asked. Ted chuckled. When have you known me to not have a big old contingency plan? He asked. I'm disappointed. But I understand, sir, Joshua said with a sigh. Well, all is not lost, Ted said, and stepped into view of the door as he put his arm around the lab-coated man. You see, 
We still have two newcomers who need to be broken in so they understand their new situation in life. Joshua grinned, the darkness in his eyes making Kowalski's stomach churn. I won't disappoint you, sir, he said. I know you won't, buddy boy, Ted said, and clapped him on the back. He snapped his fingers to the guards, and they entered the interrogation room to unstrap Kowalski. The soldier didn't have much energy, with the lack of nutrition and the bleeding, so he slumped against them as Ted stepped into the room. Take this man to the infirmary, he declared. We have an appointment to keep. His sinister and confident grin boiled Kowalski's gut. Things were about to escalate in a major way. The End Up next, the battle for Idaho continues.